So I'd like to thank the society for inviting me uh, to discuss tracheal disease in patients with congenital heart disease uh, uh, based on imaging considerations. So consider the lesions, not the diagnosis, is a very important thing to remember when considering airway disease in, in pediatric and congenital patients. This whole talk will be centered around bronchoscopy and CT scan is really the gold standard on all patients. I'm going to go through and walk you through some different lesions and try to point out how important the use of both bronchoscopy and CT scans are to help aid in caring for the pediatric patient with tracheal disease. I'm going to try to emphasize we have to think outside the box. It's not the standard typical things we think about when we think about airway disease, such as just simple resection and reanastomosis for tracheal stenosis. It goes much beyond that. And most importantly, as was discussed in the uh, earlier presentation, it's a team approach. There are many procedures that one can do to help with the airway. And bronchoscopy is considered in every case, aortopexy, tracheopexy, arch reconstruction to remove the compressive effects. When we first started airway surgery, not too many years ago, we had to come up with a naming uh, solution for when we describe the airway on bronchoscopy. So this just represents the scheme that we developed to, to name the airway, being the, the proximal tracheus T1, the mid tracheus T2, the distal tracheus T3, with the right and left bronchus represented by R1, 2, and L3. You have to understand the problem. Bronchoscopy provides you an intraluminal assessment, which is of utmost importance, and CT scan provides the external or surrounding structures that are affecting the airway. What causes airway compromise? Vascular anatomy and tracheal compression. There are many lesions, those associated with the ascending aorta, nominate artery, descending aorta, circumflex aorta, left aortic arch, right aortic arch with mirror image branching, right arch with aberrant left subclavian artery, other vascular rings, vascular slings such as the LPA sling, and tracheal rings. What, is, what types of airway disease does that lead to? It leads to tracheomalacia and tracheal compression and tracheal stenosis. So if you look at those lesions, then what are the imaging modalities that are most effective? CT scan, MRI, dynamic CT scan, a simulated 3D CT modeling, bronchoscopy, both rigid and flexible, cath, including angiograms and bronchograms. So for CT scans, they provide the external anatomic relationships, and it's really important to also consider the dynamic considerations that the CT scan may provide. A lesion such as the double aortic arch, where two limbs of the arch encircle the trachea and esophagus, this shows you in the simple two-dimensional images on CT scan, as well as a a three-dimensional image, as well as virtual and fly-through images of the CT scan. This shows end inspiration and end expiration images in a patient with a double aortic arch. These inspiratory and expiratory views try to give one the sense of the dynamic effect one may have on the airway. 
for double aortic arches, it's really important to note that there really is still significant disease left in patients in the typical way that double aortic arches are completed. And most importantly, as I'm going to really focus on in this talk, patients with tracheomalacia or associated so-called asthma constitute the highest risk group and may manifest persistent symptoms and require adjunctive procedures. In another study out of uh, Sick, Sick Kids Hospital, they also showed that there are persistent respiratory symptoms frequently associated in patients that have had double aortic arch surgery. Another entity, CT scan is very helpful in identifying pulmonary artery slings and the associated defects with it, such as complete tracheal rings and congenital long segment tracheal stenosis. This is an important study we did on patients with left pulmonary sling and the post-operative outcomes at a single center. And most importantly, what we showed here in patients with a left pulmonary artery sling, those with a left pulmonary artery sling requiring tracheal surgery had much more follow-up tracheal intervention following the LPA surgery than those patients who underwent isolated LPA sling repair. Similarly, the survival in those patients undergoing LPA surgery was better when it was an isolated LPA sling compared to those with tracheal disease that was addressed at the same time as the LPA sling. And this is a CT scan <clears throat> associated uh, showing tracheal strictures in both the in and expiratory phase, showing you that there's really no difference with a dynamic phase when it's a true tracheal stricture. And tracheomalacia, this is a really important consideration. And as the congenital surgeon, we now frequently see tracheomalacia, but there's a problem there. This is a nice fly-through sequence of a patient with tracheomalacia, both in expiration and in inspiration. And you can see the dynamic effect. <laughs> the advantages of a dynamic 4D CT of the airway are that it doesn't necessarily require to be intubated. It can be done with an LMA. Older patients can simply hold their breath it requires some positive airway pressure for inspiration and zero airway pressure for expiration. You get an angiogram, a 3D reconstruction, and it frequently can identify the location of the trachea bronchiomalacia. But what I'd like to emphasize here is that it really underestimates the severity of the trachea bronchiomalacia. And it's not useful to rule out trachea bronchiomalacia. This is very important. So just to speak a moment on tracheomalacia, it's very commonly associated with congenital heart disease. And currently there was really no standard understanding of the true effect of tracheobronchiomalacia. We need precision for understanding and for development of new treatments and therapies that we have done. Tracheomalacia is dynamic collapse. Tracheal compression or external compression on the trachea. Tracheal malformations or abnormal tracheal structures and cartilage malformation is intrinsic cartilage structural tissue. And very importantly and frequently, you may have more than one. So this is a pictorial to emphasize Trachea bronchomalacia is a dynamic airway collapse during exhalation, and it's very distinct from airway compression from vascular rings. Now, what I'd like to show you here next is a, a brief excerpt from my engineers. <clears throat> 
And what we have now used is we've taken a CT scan and done simulated 3D models that we routinely my name is Noah that we routinely my name is use Noah now on all patients undergoing tracheobronchial surgery. So I'm going to play this clip. It's a several minute clip here describing this. My name program. is Noah Schultz, and I'm a mechanical engineer with the Department of Cardiac Surgery at Boston Children's Hospital. I'm one of a large team of engineers working within the department to use engineering approaches to help solve clinical problems, including five engineers dedicated full-time to making patient-specific models for pre-surgical planning and surgical simulation. One area where we have seen really high utilization of 3D models are patients with tracheal and esophageal involvement with the great vessels. Combination of complex anatomy and cross-disciplinary collaboration has made the models a really regular part of surgical planning and patient discussion. Our models are constructed from CT or MRI imaging, and as we build them, we also consult echo and cath imaging as necessary for reference purposes. Uh, we prefer to use high-resolution isotropic image volumes as those produce the most reliable results, particularly with our very small patients. Uh, for cases where the airway and the skeletal systems are involved, the CT is definitely the standard, allowing for better delineation of the airway, bony structures, and the blood pool. Uh, the models are generally constructed a week or two before surgery and are often referenced in clinical conference when these patients are being discussed by the clinical teams. And additionally, models like these are often used uh, to explain surgeries and procedures to patients and families, uh, as well as surgical and medical residents and fellows. Uh, segmentation is generally done by creating masks of the areas of interest on the axial imaging, as you can see here, which are then transformed into surface models using specialized software. The surface models are dimensionally accurate to the imaging, so they can be used as the basis for measurement and surgical planning as well. As you can see here, the anatomical regions and structures are being outlined in color. Those colors match up to the model that you see in the lower corner. This is a model of a patient with a right aortic arch with a barrent left subclavian and diverticulum of Comorel who is experiencing tracheal and esophageal compression, uh, presenting for vascular ring repair and potential airway and esophageal repair as well. This model was based on a CT and was produced mm, a week or so before the session was going to surgery. And as you can see, it's a component model with the various cardiac volumes uh, separated out by color to allow for uh, a pretty dynamic view. This can be zoomed and rotated, and uh, we can even create cutaway views that allow for cross-sectional uh, access to certain parts of the anatomy. As you can see here, we can see the diverticulum and the left aberrant subclavian relatively clearly from the left uh, posterior side. Here you can see a cross-sectional view that allows uh, for good visualization of the compression of the airway at the carina. Um, these views can be manipulated in real time and adjusted. And uh, we even have a facility for the surgeon to make adjustments to these visuals in the operating room. These models are shared with the clinical teams and are often used intraoperatively by the surgeons to make measurements or create views that are difficult to reproduce using axial imaging alone. As you can see, we can look pretty clearly at the cross-sectional view of the trachea here and arbitrarily move that cut plane to allow us to really interrogate the relationship between the PA in blue, the aorta in red, and the airway here in light brown. These models are limited to what's visible in the CT or MRI imaging. As you can see, the esophagus in green sitting just behind the aorta is invisible in its most compressed state and reappears 
and carrier to the heart. Tracking that using the CT is a challenge and one of the limitations of using image-based modeling. So this type of simulation is something we now routinely use on all airway cases. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about bronchoscopy and the imaging modality that is really of utmost importance to us to assess the intraluminal portion of the airway. Importantly, we do a rigid, dynamic, three-phase bronchoscopy. Phase one is shallow breathing. Phase two is coughing and valsalva maneuvers. And phase three is distension of the airways to 30 to 60 centimeters of water. And most importantly, the surgeon has to view these images himself and cannot go off a report and ideally has to be present when the bronchoscopy is being completed. One has to understand the normal airway dynamics in order to be able to truly assess the bronchoscopy. Now I'm gonna show you, go through a series of bronchoscopies that show disease as we've seen it. This is coaptation with exhalation. You'll see posterior intrusion. This is evidence of tracheal stenosis that has developed in relationship to external vascular compression. You can hardly even move the bronchoscopy past this lesion. Here is posterior intrusion, where we call T2 95% intrusion. Here's the portions of the airway T2 and T3 representing severe tracheomalacia. This is anterior compression as well as posterior intrusion and a tracheal diverticulum is present in this patient. Anterior and compression and posterior intrusion combined. T3 anterior collapse and posterior intrusion. So there are many types of deformation and abnormalities of the cartilages and membranous portion of the trachea leading to significant tracheobronchomalacia, which led us to think about how can we affect this type of malaysia. And that's when we described using anterior and posterior trachea bronchiopexy sutures in order to support the airway. So an anterior and posterior tracheopexy was designed to actually utilize sutures to pull open the trachea to the anterior spinal ligament to support the trachea in order to give it that rigid structure and to directly pull anterior on the trachea to give it that anterior support. This is an actual interoperative uh, image showing us doing a posterior tracheopexy the operative image on the left and the actual bronchoscopy on the right. So we routinely use intraoperative bronchoscopy to identify exactly where we're working on the intraluminal aspects of the airway. I find this is of utmost importance 
to use intraoperative bronchoscopy to really assess the effect we're having on the airway. This is an example of uh, posterior tracheopexy. from a lateral thoracotomy position. And this is an example of a bronchoscopy in patient before posterior tracheopexy. And then the image on the right will show negative pressure being applied after tracheopexy. So here's significant malacia. And then after surgery, we're actually applying suction to the airway. And after we've done the tracheopexy sutures, the airway is completely supported and stays open. This is another example of severe tracheomalacia and after posterior tracheopexy. Now, I'd like to just briefly touch on the more standard uh, slide tracheoplasty that's done for so-called tracheal stenosis. And what I'd like to highlight here is the fact that we do intraoperative bronchoscopy at the beginning and, and throughout the surgery to guide uh, resection and guide suture placement uh, for the actual repair. So I won't play this, uh, this whole operation, but basically what this is uh, going to show you is a slide tracheoplasty in a patient utilizing cardiopulmonary bypass with intraoperative bronchoscopic guidance. You can see the light inside the airway from the bronchoscopy, and we're playing that live on the monitor as we dissect out the airway. We're using a needle to mark the site that allows us on bronchoscopy to see exactly where to make the incision for the tracheal resection. Then we're just measuring out our slide. We've opened the airway and again we're watching from the inside. We're resecting the uh, cartilage or the rings to try and avoid that classic figure of eight appearance. And importantly, you see the bronchoscopic uh, camera. We're watching from the inside to make sure every stitch is placed uh, perfectly to avoid any tracheal anastomotic stenosis. assessment of the anastomosis, looking for an early. So importantly, the takeaway is the use of bronchoscopy with intraoperative slide tracheoplasty for complex tracheal stenosis. Now, if I have a, a few more minutes, I'm going to talk about the aorta and the compressive effects on the airway. So obstruction of the airway by the aorta was found many years ago in an autopsy, unfortunately, and that's how it was reported. This is an example uh, publication that we showed the frequency of great vessel anomalies in patients with, with symptomatic airway collapse is substantial. We found this to be a major portion of our patients that are uh, referred uh, those that have great vessel anomalies contributing to significant airway compression and disease. So aortic arch airway compression can be really divided into the anominate artery, ascending aorta, transverse arch, and descending aorta. And we'll first take the anominate artery, the classic anominate artery compression syndrome, as you'll see when the anominate artery compresses on the anterior portion of the trachea. And very simply, one can do an ascending anterior aortopexy or nominate artery suspension uh, for that. And 
really the addition of an anterior trachea pexy probably is what has made the most effect and been really a contributed uh, point to the literature in the last 10 years with regard to nominate artery pexy. The ascending aorta has positional or rotational anomalies, and I must say it's really important that when you consider aorta pexy for severe trachea malacia, you use simultaneous bronchoscopy during aorta pexy, and that's probably what has contributed in the last 10 to 15 years for the improved outcomes in aorta pexy surgery on patients. This is just an example of bronchial compression by a posteriorly displaced ascending aorta in patients with congenital heart disease. This is an example of a CT scan in a patient with a rotational anomaly, an inferior and posterior great artery displacement, so-called topsy-turvy syndrome, how it frequently compresses the airway. Then we have lesions of the transverse arch. We have lesions of the ascending in transverse arch, not infrequently those patients who have undergone a DKS and Norwood operation. They have neoaortic arch aneurysms, which often result in severe tracheal compression. In this case in particular, we did a valve sparing neoaortic root repair, transverse arch reconstruction, and posterior tracheopexy with bronchoscopic guidance. This is a common anomaly that uh, some centers see after coarctation repair, you see significant disease of the left bronchus. Here, as the aorta, it has to cross over the aorta. The procedure is a left thoracotomy, aortic arch mobilization, posterior descending aorta pexy, and posterior trachea pexy. And then we have lesions of the descending aorta, which this is an example of a left arch aberrant right subclavian, resulting in essentially a circumflex aorta. And then this is an a nice image of a CT scan showing where the decent in aorta compresses the left main stem. This is an example of cardiomegaly uh, when the left decent in aorta compressing the left main stem. This is a nice example of a An approach that we recently uh, took on several patients, uh, we call it the aortic elongation procedure, and also applied a bronchial splint for late bronchial complication after neoaortic arch reconstruction. And you can see here that there is severe compression of the airway that's essentially occluded the left bronchus. And our approach was is to do an aortic elongation procedure as this diagram depicts, you can see there was compression of the airway. We elongated the aorta, gave us more space here, and then apply, applied one of our bioabsorbable splints that we created intraoperatively to place around the airway to provide external support to pull the airway open. This is an example of a left aortic arch in a three dimensional CT scan with a barrent subclavian artery. We have a growing referral base of these type of patients that have significant airway and esophageal symptoms. And these are almost all identified with CT scan and esophagrams. Again, left aortic arch with aberrant rights of clavian artery as identified on CT scan. Here. Decent in aorta pexy is a really important adjunct uh, and posterior tracheopexy for severe tracheomalacia. Uh, 
and met, left main stem bronchomalacia. And we've, we've highlighted that in several uh, publications over the last few years of the advantage of moving the aorta more posterior and using the spine to tack it to. Just another example of using, utilizing a decent aortopexy and posterior tracheopexy for severe tracheomalacia and left brain bronchomalacia. And then we talk about the circumflex uh, aorta. The circumflex aorta so right or left aortic arch that crosses posterior to the trachea and esophagus at it or above the level of the tracheal carina. You can apply some of the similar techniques that we've uh, applied utilizing uh, the direct airway interventions along with the so-called aortic arch reconstructive procedure procedures like the aortic uncrossing procedure where you take a right aortic arch and now bring it in front of the airway making a left aortic arch. Incidentally, now we do this operation routinely without the use of circulatory arrest with only a mildly hypothermic cardiopulmonary bypass and the patients are frequently extubated either in the operating room or the same day and moved to the ward the day after. This just shows the complete uncrossing procedure from the lateral view, where we've also done uh, trachea, tracheopexy support of the airway, the anterior spinal ligament, and esophageal mobilization, rotating the esophagus out from behind the airway. This is a preoperative bronchoscopy on a patient who had a circumflex aorta that had significant airway effects. This is a preoperative CT showing that, and then this is an example of the aortic arch reconstruction uh, creating a left arch, right arch, and you can see the airway now is completely uh, free of any compressive effects. This is an important uh, lesion for the surgeon to identify, and it's when you have a midline descending aorta there's really only one operation that works well for these patients, and it's what we've turned a posterior descending uh, relocation operation, and it's where you divide the aorta just beyond the right subclavian and bring it up and hook it in just under the sinotubular, above the sinotubular junction below the carina. It completely takes the aorta out from posterior and opens up this space behind the airway for uh, direct tracheal intervention. And probably one of the difficult, most difficult lesions we deal with is a left main stem lesion where it's trapped between the descending aorta and the pulmonary artery. This is just a CT scan with the inspiratory and expiratory view showing that and then this is a bronchoscopy showing 90% intrusion of the left main bronchus. And there are a number of potential solutions, and none of them are great, which led us to using ultimately an external splint on left main bronchus lesions. This is one of the early publications in the New England Journal where a bioabsorbable external splint was printed and applied. Now we use uh, splints we can create intraoperatively for patient-specific management created intraop. So in conclusion, I'd like to say consider the lesions, not the diagnosis, and every patient should get a, a three-phase bronchoscopy and a CT scan as this is really the gold standard for all patients with airway disease and associated great vessel or other external compressive effects. Consider posterior tracheopexy on these patients and consider posterior descending aortopexy. Think outside the box. It's a team approach and create your team to support you.
Thank you.